Hi again, I'm Roxanne Newman, conference producer for Analytical Cannabis, and I'm here to introduce the next talk in today's event. Phytocannabinoid, known unknowns. I am really pleased to have Geoffrey Williams joining us today as your presenter. Geoffrey is a scientist in the Process Exploration Chemistry Department at Cayman Chemical and has been an integral part of the company's Forensic Chemistry Division over the past five years. He received an MS in Chemistry from the University of Michigan in 2003 prior to joining Cayman in 2004. His research focuses on the synthesis and characterization of reference standards for phytocannabinoids, opiates, and benzodiazepine chemical classes. Warm welcome to you, Jeffrey. Following the presentation, we will have a Q&A session and we would welcome any questions that you may have. Please ask questions using the Q&A tab below the video player. If you experience any technical issues during the presentation, please request help using the Q&A system. I will now hand over to Jeffrey. Thank you, Roxanne. Hello, I'm here today to discuss details about degradation pathways of phytocannabinoids in cannabis and isolates. By identifying these degradants and the chemistry behind their formation, I hope to improve your workflow in providing the highest quality phytocannabinoid products. A little background information about myself. I'm a scientist at Cayman Chemical, which is located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. My work focuses on making phytocannabinoid analytical standards, and Cayman Chemical provides a large selection of these standards as certified reference materials, or CRMs, for both single component phytocannabinoids and mixtures that allow for their quantitation in cannabis products. We are a dedicated group of scientists trying to help make research possible in the cannabis and phytocannabinoid fields. With that, I wanna to start today's discussion with a focus on the phytocannabinoid biosynthesis. The cannabis plant uses biosynthetic pathways to generate several structurally diverse phytocannabinoids. These pathways share in common the condensation of geranyl diphosphate with a resorcinolic acid core to provide cannabigerolic acid, or CBGA. For this presentation, I will be focusing on resorcinols with a five carbon chain, which is the olivetol series, alternative alkyl chain links of one, three, four, and seven carbons, corresponding to the orsin, varin, butyl, and ferrol series, respectively, are also known and the unknowns and chemistry I discussed today can be applied to all of the varying chain length phytocannabinoids. Once CBGA is formed in the plant, it proceeds down two distinct biosynthetic pathways. CBGA can either cyclize to form CBCA by the action of CBCA synthase, or it can undergo cyclo oxidative cyclization by the action of CBDA synthase to form the substituted cyclohexene ring structure known as cannabidiolic acid, or CBDA, which itself can be further cyclized to delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinolic acid, or THCAA. Phytocannabinoid acids are the precursors to all the neutral phytocannabinoids isolated from the cannabis plant. Today's discussion will focus on the phytocannabinoids from this second pathway, CBDA and THCAA. To isolate neutral phytocannabinoids, the phytoacids must first be decarboxylated. This reaction involves the elimination of the carboxylic acid through the loss of carbon dioxide, which results in the formation of the neutral phytocannabinoid, in this case, delta-9 THC. This process may occur to a small extent in the plant and is accelerated by heat. During smoking of the cannabis inflorescences or flowers, the decarboxylation provides the psychoactive compounds for inhalation. Cannabis oil from the extraction process also requires decarboxylation to occur before the distillation step. The processing of the Processing of the plant material to make cannabis extracts and isolates is a primary source for the introduction of phytocannabinoid byproducts, including isomerization, oxidation, and degradation. These byproducts may also have some biological activity, and it's 
important to understand the conditions under which they form in order to identify and avoid them. Over the next few slides, I'll discuss a number of these impurities to be aware of. The first isomerization byproduct I will discuss is likely the most well-known, delta-8 THC. The isolation of delta-9 THC is complicated by the instability of the delta-9 isomer relative to delta-8. In the presence of acidic conditions, the delta-9 torsional ring strain is relieved through protonation followed by elimination of the C8 hydrogen. This isomerization can be accelerated by heating and is even known to occur over time as the inflorescences or extracts are stored. To date, it is not believed that the D8 isomer is a plant-derived metabolite, but merely a byproduct of processing. The delta-8 THC isomer is also known to be psychoactive with approximately 50% of the activity reported relative to delta-9 THC. This is not the only THC isomer. Another set of isomers can be formed from delta-9 THC under basic conditions. Delta-9 THC is known to isomerize under basic conditions as the relative acidity of the C10A hydrogen is increased since it is both benzylic relative to the resorcinol and allylic to the C9-olefin. Isomerization to delta-10 THC provides two diastereomers, which are separable by chromatography. The literature indicates that both delta-10 diastereomers are inactive. This is interesting because some cannabis processors have started offering delta-10 THC claiming psychoactivity similar to delta-8 and delta-9 THC. It is difficult to determine where in the process these isomers are forming and which isomer is being isolated. However, I think it most likely occurs during distillation. It may be from the presence of some minor alkaline contaminant from an earlier processing step. Identification of the delta-10 THC is also complicated by the fact that it can isomerize readily to another conjugated THC. Isomerization of delta-10 THC to delta-6A-10A THC occurs in the presence of acid. The stereospecificity of this reaction means that the 9S delta-10 THC diastereomer provides the 9S delta-6A-10A THC isomer. Likewise, the 9R delta-10 THC proceeds to 9R delta-6A-10A THC. The 9R and 9S isomers of delta-6A10A are themselves enantiomers, which can be separated using chiral HPLC methods. Both enantiomers were tested for activity in the 1980s, with initial human tests showing mild psychoactive effects for the 9S delta-6A10A THC isomer, with reported activity of around 10 to 30% relative to, to delta-9 THC. Additional animal testing models on the 9R delta 6A 10A THC enantiomer showed minimal to no psychoactivity. Formation of the delta 10 and delta 6A THC isomers generates a conjugated system between the double bond and the resorcinol ring system, which changes the UV profile of these compounds. I have seen reports that delta 10 and delta 6A 10A Isomers are being misidentified as cannabichromine or CBC. As you can see, there are similar UV profiles in this comparison of spectra for delta 10 in red, delta 6A, 10A in blue, and CBC in green. I want to now shift our attention to the reactions of cannabidiol. Cannabidiol or CBD serves as another way to access the THC structure and one that some people appear to be exploring and exploiting. Under acidic conditions, CBD can cyclize to delta-9 THC, but this cyclization is difficult to control as it usually involves heating to increase the rate and overall conversion of the reaction. Heating with an acid catalyst present leads to a mixture with delta-8 THC, which as I previously discussed is a major degradant of delta-9 THC. Over time, 
as CBD is fully converted, the delta-8 isomer will become the major isolated product of this reaction. Another pathway also exists where cyclization occurs to the cyclohexene ring structure to provide a new tetrahydrocannabinol structure, which is referred to as ISO-THC. The ISO-THC series was first described by Meshulam's lab and uses the monoterpene nomenclature. As you can see, the initially formed delta-8 ISO-THC structure is very different from the delta-8 THC structure that I've previously discussed. Additionally, the delta-8 ISO-THC isomer that initially forms readily isomerizes under the acidic conditions to provide two other ISO-THC isomers, delta-4-8 ISO-THC and delta-4 ISO-THC. Very little is known about any biological activity of the ISO-THC series, and they primarily present themselves as interferences in the HPLC baselines for THC isolates formed from this CBD cyclization. Now that we've seen what happens to CBD under acidic conditions, let's explore the reaction of CBD under basic conditions. The treatment of CBD under basic conditions is also known as the Beam test, which was first described in the early 20th century by Dr. William Beam as a colometric test. Under the test conditions, CBD is treated with a 5% potassium hydroxide solution in ethanol to produce a vibrant purple colored solution. CBD is readily oxidized under these alkaline conditions to monomeric and dimeric hydroxyquinones, which Ms. Shulam's lab was also able to identify. The monomeric hydroxyquinone, CBDQ, also called HU331, is void of phytomimetic activity, but has been shown to be a potent anti-cancer agent. Isolation of CBDQ is possible, but it has proven to be unstable in both protic and aprotic solvents usually generating the dimeric species and other unidentified decadents. This instability, along with the toxicity issues, was ultimately responsible for the lack of drug development. While the beam test has previously been used as a forensics technique to detect marijuana, it is now known that THC does not provide a positive result under the test conditions. Activation of the resorcinol ring structure and subsequent oxidation requires both free hydroxyl groups. Other quinones of the phytocannabinoids are also known to exist. Quinones of the major phytocannabinoids have all been reported as highly colored species. Like CBDQ, these phytocannabinoid quinones have been shown to have activity in PPAR gamma assays. They also have similar stability issues with activity dropping off with the formation of dimeric species. The highly colored nature of the phytocannabinoid quinones could explain some of the color changes observed in isolated cannabis extracts. They also represent just one pathway for oxidation of the phytocannabinoids. There are other pathways as well. Cannabinol, or CBN, was the first phytocannabinoid isolated at the end of the 19th century from a cannabis oil extract. Cannabinol is also an oxidative degradant that can form in cannabis products with cycloactivity of approximately 10% compared to delta-9 THC. The mechanism by which THC is oxidized to cannabinol is poorly understood. Most likely there are several different mechanisms and oxidative reactions at play. What is known is that under prolonged exposure to oxygen, light, and high temperatures, the aromatization reaction accelerates. In addition to the isolated extracts, the degradation pathway can also occur in harvested plant material with delta-9 THCAA providing CBNA, which upon decarboxylation provides cannabinol. As CBN is often considered to be an isolation artifact, handling and storage are important for minimizing and avoiding this degradation. Finally, 
I've shown several degradation pathways available for the phytocannabinoids. Some of these degradants, such as delta-8 THC, are well known, while others, such as the delta-10 THC isomers, are starting to appear in various marketplaces. The diversity of the phytocannabinoids and the exponential growth in research on the chemical constituents of cannabis could still provide us with new unknowns. Better knowledge of the chemistry behind degradation allows for the fast identification and more robust means to avoid their formation and provide the highest quality products possible. Cayman wants to be your source for high quality phytocannabinoid standards and research tools, and I thank you for your time. I am now available to take questions.